Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon to those that are in Central Time or Eastern Time. We wanted to thank you all for joining us today on our first session of our 2024 Virtual Project Directors Meeting. Uh, today, you're joining us with Allison Black, and today we're going to talk about the National Congress on American Indian State Policies and Legislation that Impact Indian Education. So I just wanted to make sure that you folks are able to access your chat. You also have options to um, submit questions for Allison at the very end, and we hope that you leave some feedback in our survey option at the end. Uh, so like I said earlier, today we have Allison Black here, the policy lead for NCAI, and we are so excited to have you, Allison. Welcome, and we're so excited to see what you have for us today. Thank you. Hejne Vadamanea, Apivawana, Nasasistas, Wakomusta, Wajaji, Ponca, Periban, Potawatomi. Good day, my name is Standing. I'm Cheyenne, but I also come from the Ponca, Osage, and Periban, Potawatomi people. My English name is Allison Black, and as Doris mentioned before, I am policy lead for the National Congress for American Indian. Um, my portfolio is the social resources portfolio, and that does include uh, areas such as education, health, uh, TANF, Indian Child Welfare, LGBTQ um, issues. Um, a little background about myself. Um, I am a for former Title VI project director for myself um, from Oklahoma. I managed three and administered three grants in three different schools um, in Oklahoma. I'm a former tribal education director as well. And um, I was unfortunately the last... <laughs> superintendent for the first Indigenous Charter School for Oklahoma as well. Um, so I have a lot of um, classroom experience, school administration experience, and of course the grant management and implementation. Um, I'm very proud to say that uh, I, I did get my start um, as a parent committee me member for um, my children's uh, Title VI Indian Education Program about 10 years ago um, after I um, started uh, doing more work on the parent committee. Um, I joined the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education Board of Directors, um, which I'm uh, in my last uh, year of uh, a past presidency. Um, and from there, I really started working on, uh, I was able to um, form um, and create the, the advocacy committee for the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education. So from there, I really got my uh, start in uh, policy and legislation at the state state level. And then in the winter of 2022, I was elected to the board of directors for the National Indian Education Association. And I serve as second vice president for that uh, board as well. And I'm proud to say I'm actually coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Um, NIA is in the midst of their Hill Week um, activities. Uh, so I've been there for meetings, um, presentations, and on Thursday, I'm very, very proud to say that our members um, in attendance will um, visit uh, Congress to advocate for their issues. So um, this session couldn't come at a better time, actually. Um, and personally, uh, I'm a, a mom to four wonderful students, uh, people, <laughs> And um, they've all gone through Indian education programs, like, thankfully. Um, and I'm married to an Oto, Missouri tribal member, and I reside in Red Rock, Oklahoma. Um, I have a, a grand dog, and I have one granddaughter as well. So that's just a little bit about myself, um, my experience, how I ended up as a policy lead for the National Congress for American Indians. And um, like I said, I'm very proud of the fact that um, my start into policy I started as a parent committee member. Um, I was just that parent that um, wanted things, wanted to help um, uh, and advocate for families and students, um, for Native students and families. And it just, it just, the need just kept growing. Um, and so I've just always been able, been very lucky to do what I do. Thank you. Um, I want to thank um, Doris and the Office of Indian Education for helping me um, throughout this um, this uh, process too. And I'm very incredibly honored uh, to be able to be here and speak with you all. And as Doris mentioned before, 
we are going to have questions um, at the end of this session. So um, take notes um, in, in comments, or even if you would like to share the things that you're facing in your community or your students, um, uh, we, we, I'd be happy to discuss those things as well. And I forget that I'm doing the slides, so um, apologies if I get behind. So if you notice on your screen, this is a little bit of uh, an agenda that we have for today. But I'll start with the purpose of NCAI. Um, I started at NCAI just this past August. Um, and since then, I've been able to take part in our uh, annual convention and then our executive council winter session um, meetings, which just happened two weeks ago as well. Um, so I'll just start here. Um, the NCAI policy team exists to further NCAI's four prong mission to protect and enhance treaty and sovereign rights, secure native traditional laws, cultures, and ways of life for future descendants, promote a common understanding of the rightful place of tribal nations and the family of American governments, and improve the quality of life for our native communities and peoples. The NCAI policy team works closely with tribal nations and tribal organizations to affect meaningful policy change at all levels of government. NCAI's efforts include working with the administration to improve federal rules and policies, working with Congress to draft, comment on, and pass legislation, and utilizing the judicial system to ensure tribal positions are articulated and heard in federal court. Through the ongoing and critical support of partner organizations and tribal leaders, NCAI's pro progresses in its historic work to protect sovereignty and incorporate Indian countries' priorities into all aspects of federal policy. As a former tribal education director, Indian education coordinator, coordinator in public schools and a classroom teacher, I'm very excited to be at the intersection of policy and practice. As educators, your, deci your decisions and support directly impact our native students, therefore our tribal futures. I'm also here to share that you have many opportunity to many opportunities to affect and influence policies and legislative relations directly. You are not just project directors, but you are essentially native student and Indian education advocates every time you come into this space. At the center of tribal communities are the people that bring vitality to our diverse groups. Groups. The health and well-being of our tribal communities are imperative in pro prog progressing towards an era of greater self-determination and prosperity. The social resources portfolio specifically focuses on the area of policy that provide for our tribal people and empower them to thrive. NCAI's work in this policy area is extensive and includes significant sustained efforts to improve education, health care, and social services for all tribal nations and their communities. And if you see on the screen, Doris was really um, awesome enough to share some resources with you as well to, to look a little bit more into the policy areas and our programs that we do offer. The National Congress for American Indians focuses on enhancing the well-being of tribal communities through its social resources portfolio. This includes research policy briefs, such as native youth data, which likely delves into issues affecting Native youth and proposes strategy for improvement. Another key aspect is the Tribal Food Sovereignty Policy Brief, <clears throat> indicating a, com a commitment to securing food autonomy for tribal nations. Additionally, the NCI NCII remains engaged in policy updates. In 2020, addressing the 2020 census, American Indian Alaska Native redistricting data, emphasizing the importance of accurate dem demographic information for fair representation and resource allocation within tribal territories. Overall, these initiatives underscore the NCAI's dedication to providing and emp empowering tribal people by addressing vital aspects of their socioeconomic and political landscape. We are proud to support the work and priorities of our partnering organizations, such as the National Indian Education Association, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, the National Indian Health Board, and the National Council on Urban Indian Health. My role at NCAI is to bring together 
tribal nations and organizations and amplify their voice to the current administration and Congress. I'm proud to say that our policy lead, policy team follows the leads of our tribal of our tribes, our tribal leaders, and our tribal organizations. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, um, NTAI just hosted their um, annual legislative meetings, um, also known as the Executive Winter Council. Um, I'm going to give a brief recap before I get into um, this next slide, but um, I, th I think it's really important for me to share this part because um, we had the pleasure of having Secretary of Education um, Miguel Sark Cardona in attendance. The Executive Winter Council session is held annually, and this prestigious gathering is in Washington, D.C. It brings together federal partners from Congress and the administration to engage in substantive decision discussions on the most pressing issues facing tribal nations. While NCAI's ECWS was filled with many prominent speakers from federal agencies and valued partners, including none other than Secretary of Interior Deb Holland, I wanted to highlight what the Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona shared at this year's ECWS just held just a couple of weeks ago. The department's commitment to Indian education and native, native language revitalization was very apparent as Secretary Cardona spoke about Indigenous student excellence. The Department of Education is fully committed to respecting and upholding the tribal sovereignty and self-determination of Native American tribes. He emphasized that speaking Native languages is not a deficit, but an asset. Dual language learners are particularly important to Secretary Cardona as he grew up in a multi-language language household. Secretary Cardona shared the initiative he created within the department called Raise the Bar, which calls for educational equity for every student everywhere. And to do so, the department must create more culturally affirming learning environments and build more pathways to to multilingualism for students, including native languages. He understood the importance as he shared the following troubling statistic. In the year, in the year 2050, it is projected only 20 native languages will be spoken. And currently 65% of all indigenous languages are now extinct. Secretary Cardona said it is the government's responsibility to ensure every tribal community has federal resources to revitalize their language with President Biden making it a policy a priority by establishing a 10 year plan on native language revitalization. The plan includes the following. First, funding language resource centers na available nationwide, which I, sh I will share a little bit more about later and I'm certain you will be or have been hearing about the centers throughout these meetings. Second is the second is the native teacher retention initiatives that will address the shortage of native educators across this country. I see this work developing in many different facets and I'm very hopeful because of Secretary Cardona's words expressed at ECWS. Regarding native language revitalization, I hope you see these act impacts and share your needs regarding revitalization efforts when presented the opportunity. In fact, I highly encourage it. And finally, the Department of Education's approach to ec education of equity is to include a comprehensive national plan, <clears throat> national study on native education, public schools, and Bureau of Indian Education schools. The baseline of this study will drive this national plan. But the most significant update that Secretary Cardona <clears throat> gave that directly impacts you as project directors right now involving involves tribal consultations. Through listening sessions, the secretary shared that his office overwhelmingly heard the need for more participation from state and local leaders in the area of tribal consultation. Secretary Cardona said it is he is committed to communicating more directly with state officials and with that tribal consultations are an expectation of the federal government, not just a guideline. Also, he shared he recognizes the importance of student data in public schools, including the need to clarify how the Department of Education and the Interior gather demographics when it comes to Native students. Through continued conversations and listening, the department is committed to learning more. So I encourage you all, if you're invited to or have the opportunity to attend any of these tribal consultation 
meeting with the Department of Education or any of their listening sessions, I encourage you to do so. Uh, they need to hear about our state level issues. For instance, they need to hear how our state school systems only capture part of our students' identity if they identify as more than one race. That is, that is problematic for project directors like you when you're obtaining your 506 forms. Lastly, he shared that intentional collaboration is important and their grant funding prioritizes this. Secretary Cardona shared that it is that it, they have a $1.6 billion investment through the State and Tribal Education Partnerships Grant, otherwise known as STEP. The investment will ensure that consultations with our tribes will re happen regularly. So again, I'm super hopeful by Secretary Cardona's words and expressing all of these. I did wanna give a brief update um, since I'm here at Hill Week <laughs> um, about some of the issues that we've been talking about, some of the legislation and priorities that we are sharing um, during this time. Um, and of course, I always encourage, um, not just because I'm on the uh, board of directors, but the National Indian Education uh, Association is a huge resource for Native educators who work in public schools or BIE or even higher education institutions or uh, tribal, tribal, tribal colleges as well. <clears throat> so some of those um, priorities, and like I mentioned before, Secretary Cardona um, is really uh, stressing and, and believes in the value of this 10-year language plan. Um, but our, our issue is we still haven't received it. And so um, we have been here all week visiting um, different um, uh, groups and uh, members of Congress to ask them to, to hurry and get that plan out. We need it so we can start moving forward. Um, we also were uh, able, we are also asking for specific um, uh, funding increases for different um, programs through the Department of Education and the Bureau of Indian Education. But one of the, the uh, items that really stands out during this discussion this week is the uh, Title VI Part A subpart, um, uh, Part A um, labeled national activities. We're asking for an increase to $20 million, but not only that, we're asking for the the uh, Department of Education and for Congress to appropriate those that funding to go to certain line items and to be delineated in those line items. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that later. But as it is, that funding will only go to 20, if we you know, we're asking for that $20 million for national activities, it just goes into one place and isn't delineated. So that is an issue for us. Um, the Board of Directors was able to meet with uh, the White House Affairs um, staffers on yesterday, um, and we were also able to uh, share our um, grief and mourning over the uh, tragic passing of Next Benedict, a, a Choctaw descendant uh, from Owa Owasso High School in Oklahoma, um, and we asked the White House to ensure the safety of all of our Indigenous students, particularly those students that are LGBTQ or Two-Spirit, uh, transgender, non, non-binary conforming, um, non-gender conforming. Um, so those are some of the things that we are talking about this week. Um, and again, I encourage you to take a look at the National Indian Education Association's uh, website to see how you can become involved or become a member. Um, so I'm really happy to get that update as well. <clears throat> So you can see on the screen um, the legislative uh, recap from the 118th uh, session. Um, and real briefly, I'm not really a, a fiscal person, and I know it's important, but I'll just briefly go over these things. Um, the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 um, implements caps on discretionary uh, spending. Um, in 2023, a significant legislative development occurred with the enactment of the measure that imposes caps on discretionary funding for the funding fiscal years 2024 and 2025. <clears throat> this legislation aimed at fiscal responsibility and budgetary control, 
establish, establishes limits on discretionary funding, influencing various sectors and programs dependent on federal funds. The significant implications and effects on these funding caps will likely have widespread consequences on government initiatives requiring careful consideration and strategic planning to navigate the financial constraints imposed the, during the specific fiscal years. This couldn't come at a more significant time as Indian education grows, not because of the needs of tribal students, but because of the successes of, of these students <clears throat> in their programs. Title VI has more program has many programs that helps over 423,000 Native students nationwide. More schools are applying for discretionary funds and tribes are applying for um, step grants in higher numbers. <clears throat> the National Indian Education Association is currently hosting their annual Hill Week and are sharing these priorities for funding. These appropriations and subsequent advocacy for them will help make good on President Biden and Secretary Cardona's work. Specifically, regarding Title VI Part A, Subpart 1, NIA has always prioritized an increase in appropriations and to move them from discretionary funding to mandatory funding. Currently, the Office of Indian Education funds over 1,200 projects and new programs are added almost annually. As charter schools begin to pop up and as tribes grow in population, there will be more tribal students to serve. And these programs are across the nation in 38 states. We know these grants are designed to meet the unique cultural and relevant, culturally relevant academic needs of Native students. We know funds under the, this program are used for academic enrichment, professional development, basic cultural away, awareness, and instruction for student achievement. We know these programs are essential to our tribal students and provide the programming that are needed to achieve indigenous excellence through tribal language classes like the Arapaho language classes taught at El Reno High School, or the native student organizations like the Frontier Intertribal Youth Leadership Organization at Frontier Public Schools in the Red Rock, Oklahoma or the family nights provided by Oklahoma City Public Schools Native American Student Services, where they learn and participate in cultural activities like ribbon skirt making and beading classes. For some students, this is the first time they encounter their tribal heritage, and this is tribal sovereignty. But there are also, also other areas of Title VI, which in the last year I've grown, grown to know more about. I've been very familiar with the, the parts um, the Title VI Part A, um, but there are other areas as well, and I'll briefly touch on those. Um, there is Title VI Part A Subpart Two, which is special programs for Indian children. This program addresses the critical issues of teacher shortages, evidence-based work at state and local level, and locally driven strategies to empower Native youth. These professional development grants are essential to improving teaching in rural communities in particular. I'll just briefly share the other areas of Title VI um, that Title VI Part A used to program administration. Uh, um, there are grants to tribes known as tribal education agencies. Um, there are also the step grants that I have mentioned before, and there are native language immersion schools and programs. Um, and of course, um, this other section of Title VI includes those Native American language resource centers as well. <clears throat> Something else that occurred um, in the last in the 118th session is the free application for federal student um, uh, update, um, and this one has been it will be beneficial, and I'll explain more about that later. Um, but this one is designed to um, streamline. Um, the application process and to make more students um, eligible for um, uh, Pell Grants and other funding. <clears throat> Another significant piece of legislation that could have impact on tribal students um, is called the Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard Affirm Affirmative Action. Another Another noteworthy development in 2023 centered around higher education and affirmative action policies. In the case of students for fair admission versus Harvard, the Supreme Court made a landmark ruling. 
the decision that institute, institutes of higher education cannot solely consider an applicant's racial status in the admission process at the moment of evaluation. This ruling addresses the contentious issue of affirmative action, set, setting a precedent that calls for more a more holistic approach to admissions, considering various factors beyond just racial background. This decision is likely to have profound implications for future admission policies at education institutions, shaping the landscape of diversity and inclusion in higher education across the United States. The concern here is that this could lead to damaging misunderstandings of tribal citizen and the place tribal sovereignty and citizens have outside of the Equal Protection Clause. <clears throat> I do want to share some of the uh, beneficial beneficial legislative uh, successes of the 118th session as well. Enacted on January 5th, 2023, the Native American language resource legislation represents a significant step toward preserving and promoting native languages. This legislation authorizes the Department of Education to, to provide grants or contracts to higher education institutions, facilitating the establishment of Native American language resource centers. The primary objective is to enhance the capacity for teaching and learning Native languages <clears throat> through cultural programming, activity, and classes offered in collaboration with these centers by fostering partnerships between educational institutions and Native communities. This initiative aims to revitalize and sustain native languages, re recognizing the cultural significance and linguistic diversity inherent in indigenous heritage. This legislative effort reflects a commitment to con cultural preservation and education, acknowledging the importance of native languages as integral components of indigenous heritage. Another beneficial success for uh, native language um, is the Durban Feeling Native American Language Act. This was enacted on January 5th, 2023 as well. It represents a comprehensive effort to assess and promote the use of native language languages in the United States. This legislation grants authority to the administration for Native Americans to conduct a survey on the state of Native American language usage in the country. Additionally, the act directs the president to evaluate the adherence of federal agencies to re to requirements promoting the use of native language native american languages and to provide recommendations for enhancing interagency coordination to further support and promote the use of these language by part prioritizing cultural programming activities and classes through collaborations collaborative partnerships this legislative initiative and aims to address the challenges faced by native american languages fostering their preservation and realization in, within the broader framework of indigenous cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Other beneficial legislative successes that have, that can have impact your program in a beneficial way um, are such as post high school planning is again, the FAFSA. Um, this, the new FAFSA reform was initially rolled out by the education department during a half window from December 30th and on December 31st. Um, it's been a slow rollout. And I know that their newest talks are that they're putting more um, money and resources into um, finishing the rollout. So if your students have applied for FAFSA, um, it could be a while before they hear back um, I've already been seeing that um, some of the, um, we've been seeing that some of the college campuses across the United States have actually pushed back their um, uh, um, enrollment dates and admission uh, uh, deadlines as well um, because of the, the, the issues with this new rollout. But the education department estimates that 610,000 more students students will be newly eligible for Pell Grants through the new form, and 1.5 more million students could also be eligible, eligible to receive the maximum amount allowed by Pell Grant. So that's exciting. 
So I wanted to circle back to the students for fair admissions versus Harvard. Um, as you can see, um, just a little bit of history about this um, decision. Um, I was able to serve on a panel with um, College Horizon, NIA, and the Native American Rights Fund in October, and we discussed this issue and its implications. The College Horizons program outlined potential implications and concerns at the NIA Convention and Trade Show in October 2023 because of the ruling that higher education institutions cannot consider an applicant's racial status alone. <clears throat> College Horizons projects that there will likely be a decrease of college enrollment complete and completion rates at selective institutions, both select uh, both private and public. Carmen Lopez, College Horizons director, shared the following regarding states like California, Texas, and Michigan, where they removed affirmative action policies um, from college admissions and their decline in enrollment and completion rates. <clears throat> In 2015, those, those campuses experienced um, only a 23% American Indian, Alaska Native, and 25% Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander <clears throat> enrollment compared to um, on average being 41% enrollment <clears throat> at other universities. Um, the six-year uh, graduation rate of American Indians, Alaska Natives was 35%, American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, finished the six year, finished six year enrollment at 43% compared nationally to 55%. Um, and 15% of American Indians and Alaska Natives and 22% of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders um, uh, obtain their bachelor's degree compared to 30% nationally. <clears throat> Furthermore, there is a concern that higher <clears throat> education institutions through admission offices will essentially scrub out tribal citizenship along with um, staking it with race and ethnicity and their evaluation processes. And there will be this can also cause confusion in other areas as well, um, such as um, Native Hawaiian and Alaska Native status. But College Horizons recommendations for students are to keep applying for admissions at the university of their choice. They emphasize that each American Indian student with tribal enrollment should still share their enrollment status, <clears throat> tribal enrollment status through all venues. Um, especially schools that use holistic admission approaches. Mm -hmm. And briefly, I'll touch over um, three of these uh, pieces that um, our office, um, our policy team is uh, keeping an eye on as well. <clears throat> the Workforce Bill, <clears throat> the Workforce Pell Act, is a legislative initiative designed to expand educational opportunity and support for individuals seeking workforce development and training. Enacted to amend the Higher Education Act of 1965, this legislation extends the scope of Pell Grants to cover short-term, high-quality programs that align with demands of the modern workforce by allowing Pell Grants to be used for shorter educational and training programs the Workforce Pell Act aims to facilitate quick entry into the job market for individuals pursuing specific skills or certifications. This act acknowledges the evolving nature of the workforce and seeks to enhance access to education, making it more responsive to the demands of a rapidly changing economic landscape. <clears throat> the Stronger <clears throat> the Stronger Workforce America for America Act represents a legislative effort aimed at fortifying the nation's workforce by addressing critical aspects of education and employment. Enacted to enhance workforce development, the act focuses on and strengthening partnerships between educational institutions and industries to align education and training programs with the evolving needs of the job market. This, this comprehensive legislation encompasses measures to boost apprenticeship programs promote skill-based education and more targeted support by underserved populations, fostering a more inclusive and skilled workforce. 
by, priori pri by prioritizing collaboration between academia and industries, the Stronger Workforce for America Act seems, seeks to equip individuals with the necessary skills to thrive in diverse sec sectors, ultimately contributing to economic growth and competitive competitiveness on a national scale. <clears throat> a short-term bill, Pell bill is a legislative initiative designed to expand access to higher education by providing financial support for short-term short -term programs. This bill, which builds upon the traditional Pell Grant framework, aims to address the evolving needs of students seeking skill-specific training and education. By allowing Pell Grants to be used for shorter duration programs, the legislation recognizes the increasing demand for flexible, targeted, <clears throat> targeted learning opportunities in the workforce. <clears throat> the short-term Pell Bill seeks to empower individuals to quickly acquire valuable skills and certifications, facilitating their entry into the job market. This approach aligns with the changing landscape of education and employment, emphasizing the importance of equipping students with practical and industry um, relevant knowledge to enhance their career prospects in a shorter time frame. The short-term Pell Bill can potentially benefit Native Americans by providing increased access to short-term educational and training programs. This legislation allows Pell Grants a significant source of financial aid for students to be utilized for shorter duration courses that are often aligned with the specific needs of the job market. For Native Americans seeking skill-specific training or certifications, this flexibility can be particular, particularly advantageous. By offering support for short-term short programs, the bill facilitates quicker entry into the workforce, enabling Native American individuals to acquire relevant skills efficiently and enhance their employability. This aligns with the broader goal of addressing economic disparities and promoting career advancement within Native American communities by providing them with expanded educational opportunities tailored to the demands of the job market. Something else our policy team is watching um, the House Committee, the House Education Committee is conducting an investigation into anti-Semitism at colleges and universities, and the scope of these inquiries include extends to probing diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion efforts within these institutions. This comprehensive <clears throat> investigation recognizes the interconnectedness of combating anti-Semitism with broader initiatives aimed at fostering diverse, equitable, and inclusive environments on campus. The effects of, on higher education institutions are notable, particularly for Indian education programs, as some are housed within DEI departments. This in integration allows for the implementation of DEI-focused student service programs, increases visibility of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color staff, and the provision of scholarships to support minority staff. The initiative reflects a commitment to not only anti-Semitism, but also systematic, systemic issues related to diversity and inclusion with, within educational settings, promoting a more an equitable and supportive atmosphere for all members of the academic community. The Summer Electronic Benefit Transfer Program is a government initiative aimed at addressing food insecurity among school-aged children during the summer months, specifically targeting families with children who qualify for free or reduced pri reduced price meals during the school year. The program provides electronic benefit transfer transfers cards that can be used to purchase food items. This program seek helps bridge the nutritional gap that arises when schools are not in session, ensuring that eligible children have access to nutrition, nutritious meals during summer break. By leveraging EB, EBT technology, the program offers a more flexible and efficient way to deliver food assistance to families. 
contributing to the overall well-being and health of vulnerable children during the extended school vacation period. <clears throat> the White House is addressing concerns regarding the sluggish implementation of the revamp federal, uh, and again, um, the White House is addressing concerns regarding the sluggish implementation of the re revamped free student federal, the federal student aid application, particularly including focusing on the soft launch of the free application for student aid form by the Education Department in late December. Acknowledging the challenges in the rollout process, the administration is actively evaluating and potentially intervening to ex expedite the distribution, distribution and adoption of the updated FAFSA. This attention underscores the significance of a timely and efficient application process for federal student aid, emphasizing this administration's commitment to streamlining access to financial assistance and ensuring that students can navigate the application procedures with ease. The involvement of the White House reflects a commitment to resolving issues and optimizing the functionality of student federal student aid programs to better serve the educational needs of students across the nation. As I mentioned before, um, I have worked on many uh, state policies and legislation, and that's where my experience derives from. from. Um, so I wanted to share some um, state policies that are kind of making their way throughout the nation right now that do have implications for um, American Indian students. Oklahoma House Bill 1775 is a legislative measure that garnered attention for its impact on educational curriculum. Enacted in May 2021, the bill restricts the teaching of certain concepts related to race and gender in public school classrooms. It prohibits the incorporation of specific topics such as critical race theory and gender diversity in mandatory courses, preventing educators from promote, promoting certain ideology. Critics argue that this bill limits discussion on systematic race, racism and historical injustices, hindering a comprehensive understanding of these issues. Supporters, on the other hand, contend that legislation promotes a more neutral and unifying approach to education. The enactment of House Bill 1775 reflects the ongoing national debate about the appropriate scope of diversity and inclusion discussions within educational institutions. <clears throat> Oklahoma House Bill 1775 primarily focused on re restricting the teaching of certain concepts related to race and gender in public school classrooms may have implications on Indian education. The legislation's prohibition of specific topics, including critical race theory, could limit discussions such as American Indian, Native American history, culture, and contemporary issues and any restrictions on addressing these topics may hinder the ability of educators to provide a nuanced and inclusive education. The impact of Indian education would depend on the interpretation and implementation of this bill, potentially influencing the depth and breadth of discussion related to Native American experiences and con contributions within the state public school curriculum. Currently, there is a lawsuit being, that has been filed by an Edmund educator who was targeted by his school district um, for violating this um, law. Uh, it has stalled um, the bill. The lawsuit was filed um, almost at the same time this um, House Bill 1775 went into law um, and it has yet to be heard. Um, so we're kind of watching how that will turn out. Um, some of the things that we've noticed in the state of Oklahoma regarding this bill is um, if you're familiar with the new movie, um, Killers of the Flower Moon, you know that it's based on a, a, real, a book written about the real life um, Osage Reign of Terror. Um, before this bill came out, we had a lot of um, educators using this book in their classrooms to, to teach about um, Native American history within the state of Oklahoma. Since then, we've had uh, teachers um, drop the book from their curriculum. Um, we've also um, noticed that um, schools are uh, 
slowly pulling back on their professional development um, when it comes to education. If you're a Title VI, sorry, and sorry, if you're a Title VI uh, grant coordinator, that's one of your um, your um, guide or um, objectives is to provide professional development. Uh, we've noticed that school districts have um, pulled back from these or they're asking for more guidance or they're scaling back on uh, the topics offered uh, on this professional development. So those there are implications for um, anti-critical race theory legislation um, on Indian education as well. <clears throat> Um, I briefly mentioned the anti-DEI um, initiatives that are happening happening nationwide. Um, I, I'm trying not to focus so much on Oklahoma, but Oklahoma um, has a lot of these um, same um, legislations and policies. Um, just recently, um, uh, I believe in December, uh, the Oklahoma governor signed an executive order uh, banning and prohibiting um, diversity inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices on all college campuses in Oklahoma. Um, uh, what we have noticed in Oklahoma is that some of these schools were anticipating this um, uh, policy or this executive order to come through or some sort of legislation. So they began preparing a long time ago, changing the names of their offices. Um, for instance, um, Northern Oklahoma College um, has a uh, uh, Nasante grant that services Native American students. Um, and it used to be called the uh, uh, Native American Student Center, um, but now they've changed the name to, <clears throat> to uh, excuse me, special populations. Um, so we, we have been seeing that across um, the state of Oklahoma. Um, so there are implications for these on um, Indian education. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about Indian education for all. Um, it is a comprehensive educational initiative aimed at integrating Native American history, culture, and perspectives into the curriculum of public schools. This initiative, implemented in various states, acknowledges the importance of fostering an accurate and respectful, respectful understanding of Native American heritage. Indian Education for All seeks to eliminate stereotypes, promote cultural diversity, and enhance the educational experience of all students by incorporating Native American content across various subjects. The initiative recognizes the unique con contributions of Native American tribes, their historical experiences and contemporary issues, ensuring that students gain a more holistic and accurate understanding of the nation's diverse cultural landscape. <clears throat> To the last of my knowledge, in January 22, several states have passed laws or implemented policies to integrate Indian education for all in their statewide curriculum. These states often work to ensure Native American history, culture, and perspectives are included in K-12 education. Some of the states with comprehensive, we call them IFA, IFA plans include Montana, New Mexico, South Dakota, <clears throat> North Dakota, and Washington. However, it is essential to note that education policy may, can evolve and new developments may have occurred since my last update, which the NIEA has addressed this week. And we're happy to say that they are working with more states currently to pass Indian education plans for all. For the most current and specific information, it's re recommended to check with your state's department education um, or relevant authorities in each state. Currently, Oklahoma, um, we have 39 tribes, um, 38 federally recognized tribes, and one state recognized tribe. Um, we have a um, American Indian Executive Director for Indian Education, but yet we don't have an Indian Education State Plan for our state. Um, and we also have the second largest Native student populations as well. Um, and I, I do have good, I do have some good news regarding um, positive. Uh, legislation that impacts um, uh, Native American students in Indian education. Um, and that is a Oklahoma Senate Bill 429. Um, this is known as the Feather Regalia um, um, Act or, or law that was signed into emergency law on July 1st. Um, this is something that is 
always been near and dear to my heart, um, being an Oklahoma tribal educator and serving on the board of directors for the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education. We worked with families every year to help them um, prepare for commencement ceremonies um, in school districts where they didn't allow students to wear um, feathers on their mortarboards or beadwork or regalia um, or uh, moccasins or academic stoles. Um, so we were able to partner and work alongside many different tribes in the state um, with the ACLU of Oklahoma and various um, non-Native allies to help us get this um, uh, Senate bill signed into law. Initially, the governor vetoed this bill, and so we had to almost start the process over again, but it took um, our tribal leaders, our students, um, all these great, wonderful community leaders to, to keep on our um, state and uh, House and Senate um, to hear this bill again, pass it in committee, and then um, override Governor Stitt's um, veto of this bill. And it was signed into law um, uh, on July 1st of 2023. Um, but I will say this with caution. Um, even though this is law and this is one of our fundamental rights uh, in the state of Oklahoma, um, I, I caution those that do have these bills to still, if your student is planning to wear a feather on their mortar board or um, regalia to commencement ceremonies, please check with your school's policies. We're already finding that and our students are being told that they still have to have their items approved. Um, not saying no, but they are giving deadlines, early deadlines of um, um, disapproval as well for um, uh, commencement ceremonies uh, happening at the end of the school year. Um, again, I just really want to thank the Office of Indian Education for Doris's help today, um, but I also want to pause and give space to Next Benedict, um, the um, two-spirit uh, transgender non-gender confine, con, uh, con, confining uh, student that was um, um, unfortunately who passed away at Owasso High School after an attack in a bathroom. Um, this has been weighing heavily on my heart. Um, I My hope working in this build and working in policy is that <clears throat> all of our students are safe. All of our students are protected. Um, so again, I want to thank you for joining us today, and we'll take um, questions or comments um, now. Hello. So we do have one question, but before we do, I want to thank you, Allison, for um, giving us a, I know it was really quick and you had to smush a lot into that, into the hour, but we do thank you for spending that time and just breaking it down for, for those that um, didn't know, or those that did know, but wanted to hear it from a, someone that specializes in legislation. Um, so a question did come in and for folks that um, want to either pop your question in the chat or in the Q and A, you have that option too. So our question is regarding ISEP funding, and they're wondering if you might have a resource um, for our project directors on the call in your role as a legislative specialist. Yes, I'm really glad that you brought up I ISEP um, funding, um, and that is an, a new area to myself. Um, I didn't know that existed, but I'm happy to say that NIA has included ISEP um, funding um, requesting an increase in that funding um, in their priorities. Um, they're included in our one pagers that we're sharing with uh, Congress members. Um, but we do, I do have a couple of resources. So if you want to email me, um, uh, Doris, could you put my email in the chat? And I think we have a slide as well too, um, to, to get you that update and connected with those resources regarding ISEP. But I'm very proud to say that that is one of NIA's uh, priorities. And of course, NCAI, we, we completely support the work and pri priorities of NIA. Awesome, thank you. I just popped your email in the chat. Are there any other questions for Allison at this time? I'll give folks a few seconds to pop them in the live Q&A board or in the chat. 
folks are saying thank you. Um, they're also saying thank you for providing space and to acknowledge Next in their story. So I don't see any questions coming in, but I do want to encourage folks that you do have the options of going to our discussion board to talk more with Allison. You also have the opportunity to even email Allison to further the discussion as well. So I don't see any coming in. Thank you for your updates, Allison. Folks are seeing in the chat. Thank you for your work and your presentation. You're so welcome. I, again, I'm just so honored to be here today. Um, and always, always remember your role as um, project directors. You are essentially that advocate for American Indian students and Alaska Native students. So we do have a question. Someone asked, do you have recommendations as to how we can support the workplace, the workplace Pell Grant legislation? That is a really good question. Um, we um, currently NCAI, NCAI does have resolution to support this initiative as well. Um, and I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, we are developing a plan of action um, and and reaching out to our partner organizations to, to help see this through because we see this as beneficial for Native American students. And I'd be happy to share that with you as well if you give me an email or shoot me an email. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Perfect. So for folks, um, this does conclude our very first session of the morning. Again, thank you, Allison, for taking a break from Hill Week and coming to spend time with us. I do want to um, highly encourage folks to please reach out to Allison, um, keep up with what NCAI is um, doing, attend their events, things happening in this year. Um, but I also wanted to say that our first networking roundtable will begin at 1240 Pacific Standard Time and whatever that time is for you all. But just keep in mind of your schedule, keep in mind of the different many sessions. Since this session has ended early, I highly recommend you um, tag along to another session to catch their Q&A as well. Uh, please take time to chat on the discussion board, download the files from our resources library, and please follow up with us, your TA team, if you may need anything th during this time. But again, thank you folks for attending. Thank you, Allison, for spending time with us, and I hope to see you all in our next session. Have a good day.